Pop Health Podcast is a public service of 24-hour home care. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Pop Health Podcast. This is Gavin Ward, host of Pop Health Podcast. In today's episode, I sat down virtually with former Senator Tom Daschle, who's still very active in politics and actually played a pretty good role in the Affordable Care Act, where he partnered alongside former President Barack Obama. Tom sat down from his home in South Carolina and talked a little bit about growing up in South Dakota, his love and passion for running, which he still does four miles pretty much every day, even in the rain, but more importantly, how he was so involved in our times post 9-11. And I know this is a healthcare podcast, but we did open it up to allow Tom to share a little bit about 9-11 and post 9-11. And then we transitioned into the Affordable Care Act and how Tom was really involved in the early 2000s of building up that framework and then ultimately partnering alongside President Obama to build what we now know as Obamacare. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. And of course, you can find more about the show at pophillpodcast.com, finding us on Apple Music, Stitcher, Spotify, and now YouTube as well. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the show. So, Tom, tell us something about yourself that might surprise the community, uh, maybe something outside of politics? Well, let's see. A lot of different things, I think. Uh, I, uh, I have a lot of outside interests. I'm a, I, I love to paint, and I'm, I'm quite a prolific abstract painter. do a lot of that. I'm an avid runner. I've run for about 40 years, and I just had a good run again this morning. Um, I, uh, uh, I've been to I guess around 120 countries all over the world. So I've uh-huh. traveled uh, all over the world. I've, not many places I haven't been in the world today. Some of the things, uh, I've got six fantastic grandchildren. My wife and I are very blessed uh, that way. We've got uh, three children and, uh, and six grandchildren. So we're, we're blessed as a family and uh, blessed uh, to have had the life I've led. Well said. Now, your run this morning, how far did you run? I usually run four miles. Um, I, uh, on weekends, sometimes, uh, I, I run a little bit longer. I used to run marathons way back, but I, no, I'm not a competitive runner any longer, but I run virtually every day. That's great. Do you have the same route that you take? Uh, are you on the treadmill? No, I, I run outside. I, I, uh, really enjoy, I even love running in the rain actually. I, um, uh, but I, uh, uh and I do have favorite favorite pass. When I'm in Washington, I run on the CNO Canal. And here in South Carolina, I have a couple of running paths that are just magnificent. They're just stunningly beautiful. That's great. Out of curiosity, when you're in Washington, um, if people recognize you while you're running, do they leave you alone or do you get uh, interrupted at times? Sometimes you get interrupted. Uh, I get stopped occasionally and people want to talk. But uh, for the most part, I'd say 90%, 95% of the time, uh, they they may wave to you or they may uh, acknowledge that they recognize you, but they let you go. That's good. That's good. Now, 120 qu- countries, what would you say is the most unique, or if you can pick, you can remember at least one of them, what's a unique environment that you've been in of those 120? Oh, that's a good question. I, I would say the Arctic may be one of the most unique environments. We spent uh, about 10 days in the Arctic and, um, uh, just a remarkable experience. We, it's a part of the world that uh, that is obviously changing dramatically now, but uh, it was quite an experience. I was there about, I guess, about 15 years ago. Wow, awesome, awesome. So, Tom, you grew up in a place that not a lot of people have been to. Tell us about your upbringing there in Dakota. Well, I was uh, very fortunate to be born in a town uh, Aberdeen, South Dakota, population about 25,000. My father was a bookkeeper. My mother uh, worked at different jobs, primarily as a home designer, and uh, um, had uh, three younger brothers. Uh, We all went to school there and uh, had uh, just a fantastic upbringing. I couldn't have been more fortunate to have two such loving parents and and three fantastic younger brothers. Spent my first 18 years there, and then I went to South Dakota State University in and, and, uh, and Brookings, South Dakota, about 160 miles south of Aberdeen, and uh, graduated and uh, went into the Air Force after that. Spent uh, three years in the Air Force as an intelligence officer and jumped right into politics after that by working for 
uh, a United States Senator from South Dakota whose name was Jim Aberesk. What inspired the desire to, uh, well, let me ask you, when you're in the Air Force, you mentioned intelligence. Was that a choice or were you assigned to the intelligence role? A little bit of both, actually. I was, I was fortunate enough to, to be uh, chosen as the commander of something called the Arnold Air Society in the Air Force ROTC program. It's arguably the highest position you can get into uh, as a ROTC cadet. And as the commander of the ROTC, I got to choose. I, I had a series of choices I could make uh, for my career in the Air Force, and I chose intelligence and uh, uh, really enjoyed that experience. And, uh, um, and it was uh, propitious in that I, was, uh, I had an opportunity to, to serve uh, in Omaha, Nebraska, which happened to be a very important state politically for George McGovern in 1972. And uh, that's how I got to work with Jim Aberesk and, uh, and then became engaged in his campaign when he ran for the Senate in 72. Okay, awesome. And did your parents have any influence on, on you getting into politics or where did that inspiration, I guess? Uh, be well, initial? I had a number of teachers that were really influential. My parents were not political. They were not, uh, they, they, they were regular voters, but they, they really didn't, uh, uh, have uh, an interest in politics. In fact, tried to persuade me to consider other professions. They didn't really believe there was much of a future in politics, and for good reason, actually. But uh, uh, I, I, uh, I was motivated partly by teachers, partly by the civil rights movement in the 60s, partly by the Vietnam War, a whole range of issues that uh, affected me as a young person at the time. And uh, caused me to be especially interested in politics and wanting to be engaged. That's where it started. Okay, awesome. So as you know, our audience are mostly healthcare professionals um, and they're not necessarily as familiar. I would say probably not all of them vote. Um, so things like majority leader, minority leader, you played big roles in politics. What does that mean, for example, majority leader? Well, there are two people that really kind of run the Congress on a day-to-day -day basis. In the Senate, it's called the majority leader. In the, Senate, in the House, it's called the speaker. Now, obviously, you have a team of leadership uh, around you, so you're not the sole decision maker. Oftentimes, the speaker relies on the majority leader of the House. Um, but majority and minority refer to the number of people that occupy the two caucuses in, the, in, the, in either the House or the Senate. If you have more than 50 members in the Senate, uh, you are the majority leader. If you have less than 50, you're called the minority leader. And the same is true in the House. If you have more than uh, 218 members in the House, you're the speaker and the majority leader. Less than 218, uh, you're the minority leader. And, and uh, there's an interesting name for the second person in charge, minority whip or majority whip. Uh, yeah. The old British expression, but uh, nonetheless, um, they are arguably the most, two most uh, powerful people in the legislative branch. There's obviously three branches of government, the judicial, the legislative, and the executive. The president, the, the leadership in the Senate, and uh, the Supreme Court generally are viewed as the leadership in, of the three branches. Okay, awesome. So while we're here to really focus on healthcare, one thing that's um, for, our, for our audience, so Tom was involved during 9-11 and post 9-11. And you actually um, mentioned in one of your books how this is perhaps two years that changed America forever. Can you briefly share about that time? Well, it changed America in a lot of different ways. Uh, first of all, it was uh, from a, just a pure institutional per, uh, pers perspective, uh, it was the first time in history that we had a 50-50 Senate, uh, 50 Republicans and 50 Democrats. And so working through that was really uh, a remarkable experience. It was uh, uh, the first time that the presidential election actually relied on a Supreme Court decision. On a five to four decision, the Supreme Court ruled that Florida had to be, uh, the recount had to be terminated and uh, and uh, as a result of that decision on a five to four basis, 
by one vote, George W. Bush became president of the United States. Um, and, then, um, and then, of course, 9-11 occurred uh, shortly after that. Uh, and, and that changed the entire infrastructure of our government in many, many respects, the way we gather intelligence, the way we go through airports. Uh, we created the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, we did a whole range of things to respond to the crisis in 9-11. And then a month later, uh, people may not recall because it was some time ago, and, uh, but there was a, a, a terrible anthrax attack in my office. And uh, uh, there had been other anthrax attacks around 9-11. Uh, a number of people died. 28 of my staff were exposed. Fortunately, none of them died. But that too changed the way completely the way members of Congress received their mail. And because the anthrax arrived in, a, in an envelope and um, exposed to, as I said, 28 of my staff. So there was just an enormous amount of history made in that short period of time of those two years. In today's realm, in today's context, you look back and in some ways that was much simpler than what we're facing right now um, in so many ways. Uh, but nonetheless, it was life-changing and had an impact that we're still experiencing today. Yeah, and before I forget, Tom, um, I believe you have, uh, which, which book of yours kind of talks about that period in more detail? It was a book called Like No Other Time. It came out in 2002. Okay, is that still available if people are it interested? It still is available on Amazon, right. Okay. Awesome, great. So, healthcare. So, we, we've talked about your background. We talked about 9-11. When did you start to really engage in healthcare policy and change? Well, Gavin, that goes back to, uh, to, I guess, the earliest days when I was elected to the Senate, way back before you were born. I, uh, I, was, uh, I was elected in 1978 for the first time by 14 votes, by the way, in South oh, Dakota. Wow. Very small margin. I went through a year and 21 days of recount. Uh, but I was Wait, how, long, how long of recount? A year and 21 days. <laughs> and, um, it took a long time for me to be declared the winner. It was, it was, it was a few days after Thanksgiving, the year after the election, uh, that I was finally uh, declared the winner. But I, but I was seated conditionally, and I was appointed uh, because I was a Vietnam era veteran. I was uh, seated conditionally uh, on the Veterans Affairs Committee. And because I was the first Vietnam era veteran, one of the um, issues especially that concerned me was the health of uh, Vietnam veterans. And there were two issues in particular, Agent Orange and uh, PTSD affecting Vietnam veterans that interested me a great deal. So I became one of the, the lead sponsors of most of the legislation dealing with Asian Orange and PTSD at the time. That led me to understand healthcare from a veteran's perspective, and I took a more active interest in healthcare generally as a result of those experiences. When I came to the Senate, I, I was fortunate enough to be elected and then get appointed. Uh, very, it's very rare for a freshman to be appointed to the Senate Finance Committee, and the Finance Committee is in the Senate is one of the committees primarily responsible for health policy. So that gave me a whole new series of opportunities and avenues for engagement in health policy. And one thing led to another. When I became leader, it became really one of the, the most important issues for me. It's been that way ever since. So Agent Orange, I think a lot of us, uh, myself included, we've heard that term before. Um, I was born in 1980, and so I wasn't like you <laughs> You referred to uh, when you started. So Vietnam War, where you were helping veterans at the time, what was Agent Orange? Agent Orange is and was a defoliant. It uh, defoliated trees. So people, uh, so intelligence analysts and others could actually see troop movements through the trees much more easily. And so by defoliating the trees, it stripped the trees of all the leaves and you could see troop movements and, and other activity much more effectively. And it was used extensively. People had no idea, however, how carcinogenic uh, this defoliant was. 
and carcinogenic not only on Vietnamese, but on American troops. And a lot of troops who were in those trees when that defoliant was sprayed were affected very adversely. And unfortunately, it has what we call tetragenicity. That is, it has the capacity to be genetically uh, carried to your, to your children. And uh, so some of those carcinogens don't just leave uh, or stay in your body. They, they, they're connected to, uh, to generational, uh, uh, it has generational implications. So very, very serious. And uh, it took a long time for the United States to acknowledge its, its uh, responsibility and to acknowledge the, the dangers of this highly carcinogenic uh, product. Wow, that, yeah, that's great for a lot of us to be aware of, and um, thank you for sharing. So while you weren't uh, necessarily actively serving in a Senate role, you were involved in the development of what eventually became known as Obamacare and afford the Affordable Care Act. Can you tell us about some of your initial work prior to that being rolled out that you were involved with? Well, when I left the Senate in 2005, Barack Obama was just a uh, coming to the Senate, and uh, he, was, uh, he was very kind to hire uh, at least half of my staff when I left. And so I developed a close relationship with uh, President Obama back when he became a, a freshman senator. And uh, so we, uh, we developed a mutual interest in healthcare over the years. And when he uh, began running for president, he asked if I would be one of his national co-chairs. and. I was very flattered to, to play that role. And one of the issues I spent a good deal of time on on his behalf was healthcare. And uh, over the course of his campaign and in the early uh, period of the following the election and the transition period, um, we, we started to develop what would be the framework for Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act and, uh, and uh, had uh, I was very supportive of and, uh, and uh, uh, tried to be as, as helpful to the president as I could as, I, as he uh, worked to, to, to pass it ultimately. But basically, it recognizes three things in essence, Gavin. One is the absolute need for universal health care in this country. We still don't have it. We're still far short of where we need to be, especially now with COVID. Yeah. Uh, there may be over 50 million people who are uninsured and at least another 50 million people who are underinsured. Yeah. So we have a serious problem with regard to insurance coverage, but it recognizes that uh, we've got to work to achieving universal coverage. And this was yet another uh, major yet incremental step in doing so. The second thing it acknowledges is that for all of uh, the past 100, 130 years, uh, really to the turn, the turn of the 20th century, we have had what I've always called a public-private partnership in healthcare. The public and the private sectors both play roles, and it's not nearly as integrated as it should be. Uh, in fact, I've often said that we don't have a system. We have a collage of subsystems in healthcare, mm -hmm. public and private. And uh, we can argue whether it should be all public or all private, uh, but at least for the foreseeable future, it's gonna remain this public-private partnership. And the ACA recognizes that reality, that it is going to be a public-private partnership for the foreseeable future. And it was designed to see if we could make it work better. And, uh, and in so doing, um, that was really uh, a critical need. The third thing that it acknowledges that there are certain ways to define what health insurance really is and what protection should be guaranteed. So it laid out a series of definitive guarantees to all people, especially if they had pre-existing conditions, uh, if they were going to sign up for health care, they knew at least there would be a minimum number of services provided. So that package of benefits was really very imperative as part of this overall design for the Affordable Care Act as well. But those three things, universal access, having a PPP reality check, and third, guaranteeing the benefits were the essence of what the Affordable Care Act was all about. 
Awesome, great summary. So today here in 2020, as we record, has the execution and oper op I guess, yeah, just the execution of the Affordable Care Act, what has worked well and what still needs improvement? Well, unfortunately, it's become a toxic political issue, and I really regret that. Uh, toxic almost from the very beginning. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I regret, I lament the fact that the Supreme Court made its decision to give states the choice on Medicaid expansion. Uh, now I think we're at 39 states that have expanded Medicaid, uh, in some cases as a result of a public vote, a referendum, most recently in Oklahoma, which is very encouraging. But there are still states that haven't expanded Medicaid, denied millions and millions of Americans the benefits of Medicaid uh, coverage that, uh, that other states now enjoy. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that it became a toxic political issue in Congress. There were something like 75 votes to repeal the Affordable Care Act over time. And, and that unfortunately has undermined our ability to provide kind of the continuity and the ability for it to work more effectively. And third, uh, I have to be candid and acknowledge that the rollout of the initial Affordable Care Act was, uh, was uh, not what we had hoped it could be. And we, mistakes were made along the way. But over time, I think it's now become an integral part of our healthcare collage of subsystems. Uh, about 20 million people in this country benefit from the Affordable Care Act today. It should be a lot higher. Maybe someday it will be a lot higher. But I, uh, so I think there's still a lot we can do. We've got to make, uh, make it more affordable. Uh, we didn't put as much emphasis on affordability as I wish we would have. We had plans to do that, but they were vigorously opposed by many in Congress. And so many of the tools that we had to control costs were not implemented. Um, but nonetheless, uh, we've got to do a lot better job of, of uh, expanding access, improving our ability to control costs, and obviously working on quality. We, it, it is lamentable, and you, I'm sure you and your listeners know this very well, Gavin, that we hardly rank in the top 20 in overall quality in, this, uh, in, in, in healthcare in the world today, largely uh, uh, through our own making. Uh, there are things we should be doing that we're not doing. Uh, the fact that hundreds of thousands of people die from medical mistakes every year is just inexcusable, and we've got to do a better job on quality. You mentioned our ranking as a nation. Um, is there a country that you look up to? Like if you can give a, when you're just your opinion, um, what country do you look up to in healthcare and why? Well, there's an interesting story behind that question uh, in my view. I, I, uh, back in the early 1990s, you may know this, I'm certain some of your listeners know this, Taiwan made a decision to create a national healthcare system for the first time. And they sent a team of experts all over the world to pick and choose some of the best practices used by other countries from around the world. And they created a healthcare system that I think most health experts today would say is probably the best in the world. It's a small country. It's only about, if I recall, 37 million people. So it's easier when you've only got a tenth of the people that we have in our country, roughly. But, I, uh, but they've really created a healthcare system that acknowledges uh, quality, acknowledges universal access, acknowledges the importance of controlling costs, and really does it effectively. So there are countries, um, and you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit, uh, I think, uh, presumptuous for us to say, well, we will just uh, uh, adopt a system that works well in another country. I say presumptuous because just because it's worked well in Taiwan doesn't mean necessarily it would work well in this country. Right. So we have to be a little leery of just saying, well, let's just adopt something that works well in another country. Canada, for that matter, has a more effective system than we have. Uh, and it happens to be one of the most popular healthcare systems in the world today. The most popular person in Canada is the person who, uh, who created, who founded the healthcare, Canadian healthcare system in Saskatchewan about 50, 40, 40 some years ago now. So it's, uh, 
it, 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 it's, uh, it's something we have to continue to work on. But I think we can take best practices from other countries and see if they can be applicable here. But we have to be leery about just adopting and practice uh, a whole host system from another country. Yeah, well said. I, I really uh, admire you for acknowledging that. I know certain leaders uh, may just say, hey, let's copy that. Uh, you know, and obviously it's much more complex. Um, I have one of my best friends, Tom, is uh, he's a doctor here in the United States, but he's from Taiwan. He's an immigrant from Taiwan. So uh, I'm going to share this with him and he'll, I'm sure he'll be proud. Um, so as a politician, there's a lot of forces. You know, when you are an active politician, you have your voters, you have your constituents, you have your colleagues, you have your heart. I know this, I don't mean this to be a loaded question, but what do you go with when, you know, you're, there's all these conflicts? How do you solve that problem? Well, that's a real good question. And it's a, a question I think every elected official has to confront and, and answer in his or her own way. Uh, in my case, I think it's best answered by saying all of the above. I think it's important that you weigh your constituencies as they uh, express themselves on a given issue. I think it's vitally important that you listen to the experts and try to ascertain the facts. And in this era of gross misinformation, that's all the more an important yeah. factor. It's so easy, I think, to rely on social media or uh, media that may or may not be accurate. And I think it's really critical and imperative for a, a political figure, a, an elected leader, uh, to do as much as possible to ascertain what the real facts are. But then I think it's also important to apply your own conscience and uh, make your best judgment. Uh, I think that's what you're elected to do, is to make your best judgment. Uh, I, I think it's in a democracy, and especially in a democratic republic, those three factors all are critically important, getting the facts, making sure you know your constituency's points of view. And of course, in most cases, there are, uh, there are, there are, 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 are uh, divisions within your constituency. Uh, pick the issue and there's going to be a division. Yeah. There's rarely unanimity among your constituency. So getting some sense of what the majority of your constituents think is in and of itself a fact-finding challenge. And then also your, your conscience really has to to play a, a significant role. And obviously you come to your office uh, with, with a philosophical point of view uh, on, on things that uh, have uh, a lot to do with how you think things through uh, in a conscientious way. But uh, I think those three factors are the most important. Okay. And uh, so Linda, special lady in your life, this might apply to many of us and all of our listeners who have a significant other. In your role, Tom, there's a lot of things you can't share with her So during your political career. So how was it wanting to like maybe vent uh, to her or get her opinion and her also being curious, was that a challenge to like be cautious what you said and what you didn't say? Did you want to tell her things? Did she want to know things? Tell us about that. Well, she, she has uh, her own uh, very success, had her own successful, very successful career uh, in aviation. She was the acting administrator of the Federal Aviation Administration. She was the deputy administrator of the FAA for about four years and the acting administrator for, uh, for about a year. And uh, so she had most of the intelligence clearances that I had. Uh, in fact, uh, Sometimes we would get calls uh, during the middle of the night and it would be for either her, her or for me. So uh, I was fortunate in some ways that she had uh, the same ability as I had to share intelligence and to, uh, to have information that isn't oftentimes known. Uh, we've had the good fortune to be together now for about 40 years. So uh, we've, we've developed a a routine and I think an understanding about what we can and cannot share. But for the most part, it's really remarkable. We, we share almost everything. And I think that's been partly the success of our marriage. 
Awesome, Tom. So as we get towards the end of the show today, uh, as I mentioned, our audience is primarily healthcare professionals. And one thing I've heard among some very highly respected people is their vote doesn't count um, or eh, I'm not going to vote. So can you share why our healthcare audience, why it's important for them to vote, especially on healthcare related issues? Well, one of my favorite stories is uh, the story of Ben Franklin, who uh, when our founding fathers were creating the, the infrastructure for this country, he was delegated as the spokesperson. And the very first night after they were meeting in Philadelphia, he walked out on the steps and a doctor, uh, a woman, uh, yelled to Dr. Uh, to, to Benjamin Franklin, uh, Mr. Franklin, have you decided what kind of a country we're going to have, a monarchy or a republic? And he yelled out, uh, he yelled back to the woman, um, a doctor, uh, it'll be a republic if we can keep it. And I think that's been the essence of our responsibility ever since he uttered those words, whether we could keep this republic. Um, a million people, Gavin, have died fighting for this country so that we keep it. We either, if we're going to keep it, we have to either fight for it, as many have and as have died for it, or we have to work at it. And if we don't work at it, and voting is the essence of working at it, citizenship is the essence of voting, uh, we're going to lose it. Other countries have lost it. And it's almost impossible to get back once you've lost it. So if you care about this country and the freedoms we enjoy, uh, if you're not going to fight for it, if you're not going to be called upon to fight for it, at the very least, you have to work at it. And at the very least in working at it, besides just paying your taxes and being a good citizen, you got to vote or we're going to lose this country someday. And I uh, don't want to be a part of that and have that responsibility. Thanks, Tom. Lastly, um, it is, we're recording in the summer. Uh, this will be released probably towards the end of summer, early fall. And there's a lot of issues going on in our world. Um, one thing that's been brought up recently is equity in healthcare based on demographic, income. How do we provide, I mean, this is kind of a loaded question, but how do we improve access? How do we make healthcare equitable? Well, we've got to do a whole lot better job of making it equitable in part by expanding universal access. We still have barriers to access all over the country today, partly related to cost, partly related to uh, the boundaries and the, and the barriers that exist for minority populations especially. Uh, they don't have the same access as the rest of us and uh, that's a real problem. Secondly, it's, it's, it's seriously, a, a, a continues to be a major cost issue. Uh, there have been studies done, polls taken that people can't even afford a $400 surprised uh, medical bill today. Yeah. They couldn't pay $400 if required to do so. That keeps them from going to an emergency room. It keeps them from going to a doctor when they're sick. And as a result, they pay a high price for that. Um, uh, unfortunately, COVID has affected uh, minority populations far more dramatically, partly because of uh, their living conditions and their working conditions. They're more likely to be in an assembly line. They're more likely to be on the front lines and retail facilities. And so we've got to do more to protect our workers and do as much as possible to ensure that we take as many preventative actions as we can. The other thing we haven't done, Gavin, we haven't had a chance to talk about it today, but public health plays a huge role. And we have lost over 50,000 public health officials just in the last 10 years alone. We've got to put new emphasis on investing in public health if we're going to deal with the disparities in healthcare going forward. Tom, you mentioned we've lost 50,000 public health officials. Does that mean those roles no longer exist or they just left and we need to inspire new leaders? A little bit of both, but mostly the former and not the latter. Those uh, budgets have been cut. Uh, positions have been eliminated. We've de-emphasized public health over the course of the last uh, 50 years, and it's, we're paid a high price for it. Thanks, Tom. Well, hey, really appreciate you taking the time to share with our audience, the healthcare professionals. Tom, um, what are you looking to do today? What are you involved with? Why should people get in touch with you? 
Well, we, uh, I uh, had the good fortune to, uh, to create uh, what we call the Dasho Group. It's a consulting business that works on a lot on healthcare policy. We have clients across the board and we do a lot of, uh, a, a lot of work uh, with, with members of Congress, with the administration, with states. Um, uh, healthcare is still a passion of mine and through the Dasho Group and through the fine professional experts that we have within our organization, we're able to continue to contribute. And so that uh, is, uh, it will continue to be a passion of mine as, as long as I'm healthy. Awesome. And how do folks uh, learn more about the Dashiell Group? We have a website. Uh, they're just uh, Google the Dashiell Group and you can find us there. Awesome, Tom. Well, hey, thanks so much for joining today. I also just want to say a big thank you to Darcel and Tiffany for helping coordinate uh, today's episode with you, Tom. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in to another episode of Pop Health Podcast. We hope you've enjoyed today's episode. And if you have and want to check out other episodes, visit us at pophealthpodcast.com, iTunes or Apple Music, Spotify, Stitcher, and now YouTube as well. Take care.